get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, now Keith Lee, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Keith Lee, who is president and owner of five businesses, American Retail Supply, 3D Mail Results, Lean Marketing, just to name a few. And he's been practicing the power of exceptional customer service since the 1970s. The wholesale distribution business alone grew from one employee to more than 60. In a given year, they deliver over 46,000 orders to over 8,600 clients, and they have a selection of over 600,000 promotional products you can use to make sure your customers or prospects never forget you. I use them. Keith, thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. Thanks, Jeremy. You know... What's interesting, studying and researching you, I found what I find is the Keith Lee three keys to success, three-pronged approach. And you'll tell me if this is accurate. So one is employee happiness in a business running a highly productive team. Two is customer service. And three is marketing. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you hit it. You hit it pretty pretty darn close. And I want to I want to go into each of those and your try you know your tried and true methods that you've actually practiced in the trenches. And I know your new passion right now is to improve the lives of one million people. And you'll tell us how. And this is also the reason why you sold American Retail Supply, right? So start with that. What made you? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I developed a management system out of just pure need for myself. I was at my wit's end. I went out in the 90s and studied uh, W. Edwards Deming, Joseph Duran, Phil Crosby, um, and found out that there really wasn't anything out there that was great for non-manufacturers. And, but I used all of the stuff that I learned from those guys, along with uh, creating the power of buy-in from your team, if you will, to create my own management system that I used in, <clears throat> in my business. I've used it since the early 90s. Right. And it created a business that improves whether I'm there or not. And it also is a business that people love to be a part of. You probably don't know this, but <clears throat> a number of years ago, Washington CEO Magazine named us the best small business to work for in Washington mm. State. That's awesome. Now, we didn't earn that honor because we had foosball tables or, or daycare <laughs> or, or any of those kind of things. Right. We, we earn the honor because Washington CEO told us that more than any other business that uh, was part of this, our team members could, could espouse and say our vision, our mission, our values as much as our managers could. And they saw that they were practiced on a daily business, on a daily basis in the company. Right. And um, so when it, that management system has evolved over the years and I frank, really truthfully had people come to me and say, hey, um, can you share this with us? And it was like, well, yeah, I can share it with you, but I don't, I, I can talk to you about it, but I don't have anything. And then- There's nothing formal uh, there, I've, you mean? Right, I had a, I had a, um, uh, a guy, I and my, um, um, what do you call it, mastermind group, my mastermind group yeah. in, here in Seattle that we were talking about, about it. And he said, you know, Keith, if you were to develop that management system and bring it to market, you could do that for all of these other businesses. And you could create a business that was well-run, that people love to uh, work at. And what I had told this guy also before that is we had been talking about our our, our um our our legacy that we will leave, and I the told legacy, him my yeah. legacy is, my legacy is that I want my family and my very close friends to say, "Wow, I'm glad he was part of my life," mm-hmm. and that's really the legacy I want to leave. And so Jeff came back and he said, "Well, you know, Keith, if you develop that management system, you could do that for other business, for other 
their family. And that kind of got to me and I, and I decided that, yeah, I'm going to develop this. I'm going to bring it to market so that other people can use it in their businesses. And so that leads to my goal. And I was, I got this a bit from the people at, um, at uh, Ryan Dice. <clears throat> I, I was thinking about what do I really want to, to do? with this business. And, and I decided that I really want to f- positively affect the life of a million people mm-hmm. with this uh, Keith Lee business systems. And the way I do that is that I get 10,000 businesses to start using it. Their business runs better. Their team members love working there. So you've made the, uh, an effect on uh, 10,000 business owners, but not only that, all of their employees or we call them team members their team members like their job better they 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 go home more enthused and they affect the life of their entire family and that's how i want to affect positively the life of a million people right. uh, in in keith lee business systems so how do you so that's finally what I'm doing now <clears throat> yeah so how do you i mean it's a big decision to sell american retail supply and we'll get into some of right. the background but how did you finally decide? What did it come to where you're like, okay, this is it. I need to, to do this. What well, were some of the things the rea- leading up to that? Yeah, 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 the reality is that, again, going back to my mastermind group, yeah. we, had a, we had gotten in talk about uh, the whole idea of having a five-year plan to exit your business. Yeah. And a uh, gal in there named Bosch Tolson told me, told all of us about a guy named Greg Vrykovsky and that he was good at doing that. Well, I'm 61 years old and I thought, you know, hey, I'd probably want to jettison my biggest business in the next five years or so. So I went and I talked to uh, Gregory and Gregory, um, we shared a lot of things and yeah. he came back and he said, you know, Keith, your your business is in prime shape to shell, sell right now. Mm. The biggest thing is you have the system in place that somebody can come in and take this over right now um, very easily. And uh, so if I don't have anything for you to do really over the next five years, but if you're interested in selling your business right now, I think I can get you a great price. And so he said, "Are you interested?" And I said, "Well, that depends. Tell me what the great price is." <laughs> so I gave him a bunch of I gave him a bunch of documents and whatever, and he took right. his time to go through it. He came back and said, uh, "You know, are you interested in selling for this price?" And I said, y- "You bet I am. I'll be more than happy to sell for that price." And but it was also the whole idea that it gave me the freedom then to work on the Keith Lee business systems a lot more, mm-hmm. um, even though the business ran great without me. Right. Um, I still, it still needs, it still needs a leader. It needs, it, needs it needs, it needs, it needs, it needs to go somewhere. And frankly, that business, American Retail Supply, was not getting enough of my time when it came to that, when it came to vision and yeah. leader and where we want to go and what's the next step. So it, it was the right time for me to sell yeah. it also for that reason. Yeah. So Keith, you know, obviously that five year <clears throat> exit plan is because probably for people who don't have systems in place, right? And you had those so, systems in place. So what systems for the business owners listening, what systems did you put in place that allowed you from day one when you met that guy who's like, yeah, you're ready to sell it right now. What what type of systems can you talk about? What's really well, systems are really simple. Yeah. Problem is most most management gurus don't want you to think that systems are simple. And and frankly, the reason they don't want you to think that they're simple is that they want to be in your business, working with you side by side for months on end, give and you paying them thousands and thousands of system simply the documented way to do something you uh, and you document every single thing you do in your business mm-hmm. everything from here here's one for instance that yeah. we have that, that, that people, yeah give me a few examples can, yeah everybody can relate to it <clears throat> you have mary comes in work and she's got the uh, a fundraiser for a kid's uh, um, cookie sale and she comes into work and she goes around to everybody's desk and tells them about the fundraiser and that da 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 wastes everybody time. So we have a we have a system. It's simply the documented way, proper way you do that for bringing your kids fundraisers to work. And it basically says you can um, put the product in the lunchroom. You can send out an email. You can put a note in everyone's bin. Um, and and about and those are the things you can do. And you can't approach anyone directly or put the product out in our display room. And it basically says everything that you that 
it says exactly the way that you should do that. And the reason I use that one is that it's, it really is important to get the little things done, not just the big things, but the little things that just waste time and, and waste mm-hmm. everybody and make people uncomfortable, etc. So you basically just write it down. Another one is, is exactly how to answer a transferred call. Mm-hmm. Now, we have all of our phones answered exactly the right way when the incoming call comes in because it's easy to train a, the receptionist and their replacement or the person that covers lunches and whatever. That's that's easy, And but we also have that document. We have it written down exactly the way it should be. But another one is, is how to answer to exactly answer a transferred call. So you don't have somebody answering, hey, yeah, what's up? Or whatever the case, hey, you want professional, you know, and you want to be, um, in our case, we don't want to be stuffy, but we want to be professional. So we document the exact way that you are to answer a transferred call. And we give them a couple different little scripts to use. You can can be, uh, thanks, Thanks for holding. This is Keith. There can be good afternoon. This is Keith, but it can only be a few of those different things. And and yeah. what happens is that when every single thing is documented, <clears throat> then um, we know the right way to do it. But here's what's critically important: yeah. we call each of those job each of those documentations, each of those systems. We call them make you happy job requirements. And at the bottom of every one, it says, "Do this exactly like it says here." Unless it doesn't take care of the customer or the external customer. If it doesn't take care of them, do what you need to do and then get this changed so that it's proper. So that basically that ensures that we have continual improvement all the time and that we really do want our people to find things that are broken and fix them. Yeah. and we talk about the internal and external customer, the fact that your external customer is the person who buys the stuff from you. Your internal customer is everybody you work with, everybody that's dependent on the quality of your work, your coworker, the FedEx guy, the suppliers, all, all of those guys. So we talk about that whole idea of the internal customers also, and that if you're doing something that's documented in one of these that doesn't take care of your internal customer or doesn't take care of you, then you change it, you do what you need to do immediately and then but now you're responsible for helping to change it to what it needs to be yeah Keith I want to find out uh, one of the biggest systems you put in place that made the biggest difference you know because obviously all the small things make a big difference but I first want to find where do these documents live like if someone's like yes Keith that sounds amazing I want to do this What's the first great thing question. they should but, start to do? Anyway, that's a, that's a great question because it's like, you know, okay, you get all these together and then how do you find them? You right. know, how do you find what the rate, right? Yeah. Well, the, the magic of Windows is okay. fabulous with folders. I mean, you just simply save them in your folder. And the, let's say that and we have a folder that's for everyone. It's all, everyone in the business, all, the, the MJRs, the Make You Happy Job Requirements that apply to everyone in the MJRs, business. MJRs, so I like have, that. MJR, make you happy job requirement. And then we have the ones that are for accounting, the ones that are for sales, the ones that are whatever. So let me give you, for instance, a call tag, a UPS call. We we send out the the label that gets put on the box and the customer sends the product back to us because it got shipped wrong or something like that. So all they do is they'll go into... Uh, a salesperson will want to know how do I, I I forgot how to do this how do I do it so they go into the folder of sales and up in the search they type in call tags and up comes three or four different um, MJRs on call tags yeah. one might be uh, when to send them out and one might be how to actually fill them out and da 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 and so they look at those two or three and, and all of a sudden they got oh okay this is how I do call tags yeah. so that when that person is initially trained by their sales manager you know they they go through these things and they and they 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 may not even have to ever work with a salesperson or with anyone right. in 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 learning how to fill out a call tag because it's right there. They, and they've gone through when they first start and they skim through all of the MJRs and, they, and they, uh, they read them and they skim through them. They know that it's there. They know that call tags are there somewhere and they're covered. So now they go back and they learn how to do it. And this, what ends up happening is that you get people up to speed so much faster. Yeah. You get people ready to go at work. And then what, what's really cool, what I love, I got a, a guy named um, Preston Letts and uh, Letts... Uh, 
<clears throat> property management, he used to be just terrified of, of, of turning a job over because he knew that if he fired somebody, it was just going to be more work for him. Right. And we've all, right, we've all right, been right. more work for you, more work for everyone else. Once he put together all the systems and everything that every, that person does, yeah. it's so much easier to bring in the new person and get them up to speed. And what we really find out, which is really cool, is that now this new person comes in, he gets up to speed really quick. Yeah. But what's really f cool about it is that person comes in with a new set of eyes also. Yeah. So that person is seeing things that can be right. improved. So recently had our, our uh, manager of our of the warehouse in in Honolulu leave. <clears throat> and I said to Mary, our VP of operations, that's too bad. Uh, he's really good. And she said, it's no big deal. It, it always works out for the best. And, and it did. <laughs> and the new guy came in, got up to speed in no time. And then with his new set of eyes is making improvements to what's going on over there. Yeah. And that was with a position that I thought was running very well. Right. Yeah, that, that is huge. And it's also not only a new set of eyes, but it's also takes less of your current staff's time to train and get that person up to speed because those things are already documented. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like, again, going back to the call tag example, before it would be a, the sales manager going over that with yeah. them uh, step by step, how to do it. And yeah. then when it actually came up, they going over it again, step by step in how to do it as they'd forgotten. And, but now it may not even actually be trained. It may be just simply first time you need, this is what call tags are. This is what, why we send yeah. them. And the first one, and, and when you need to do one, go here and learn how to do it yeah. rather than being trained to do it um, unnecessarily. Yeah. Yeah, Keith, I love that you talk about this because these are the non-exciting details that, <laughs> that make are. a business run smoothly and really make a business run. And, you know, for someone out there thinking like this, that sounds great and they don't have the discipline to do it. How did you originally get yourself disciplined to do this, to put these in place? Because it, it does take some really structure and discipline. Yeah, it does. And 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 here's here's um, you mentioned at the beginning. This is the non-exciting stuff, and and I couldn't agree more. It is the non-exciting stuff. But the reason that I had to put it together in the first place is that I love marketing. Yeah, I want to spend my time marketing, but I I was spending all my on fixing things and everything else. Yeah. So I had to get to the way so I could spend my time on marketing. It's, what it amounts to. But to do it, basically to start with, it's a huge process, okay? It's a huge process. And you start by just um, documenting every single yeah. thing. And you, and, you, and you do it like you eat an elephant, one bite at a time. I'm just wondering, now, here, <clears throat> was there like a what, huge pain point for you at some point? Like, Oh, there's a huge pain point. Yeah. And I was in the, in, the, in the 90s, the business had grown dramatically. I took it over in the 80s, yeah. in the early 80s. In the early 90s, the business had grown dramatically, and I was, uh, when I do a, a PowerPoint on this, I show a picture of me going to work in, in 1991, and I've got a picture of me looking like you and I do right now, okay. and then I say, and this is me after a half an hour of work, and my face is all red, and it's totally gone, and it's because, and that was a pain point. I'd gotten to the point where a lot of people get in their business where the business, they just cannot control it anymore, and it's not fun. Um, I had gotten to the point that I had become a slave to the business. Yeah. Uh, it grew just fine, but I'd gotten to the point where I just said, I don't want it to grow anymore. But then what happened is the Chamber of Commerce had this uh, thing on total quality management, which is my business, my management system is somewhat like that, but it's, it's, it uses a lot of that, but that is not at all, that will not work. But I saw this light at the end of the tunnel and then psychology i love one of the reasons i love marketing is that psychology is simply marketing is simply psychology and math put together <clears throat> the um um are you there yeah i'm here i'm here we had a yeah okay my thing just said it had an internet problem but okay so but that's one of the reasons that um I love psychology and math, so then I put the psychology in with the system stuff to make sure that we get buy-in from the system, from the people. But let me tell you what the big 
thing is that I did yeah. that Jeff wanted me to do to make sure that this is not a huge elephant eating tasks for my clients. Yeah. Here's the reality. We have somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 MJRs in my different businesses. Yeah. About 80% of them, <clears throat> a number of them, about 80% of them can be tweaked from my business that you can use it in your business and it'll work just fine. We all do the same things in our businesses. Right. We, we, we answer phones, we process checks, we ship things, we do those things. Yeah. So what happens? Let's, let's go back to that MJR on, on how to hans, answer a transferred call. Yeah. <clears throat> if I give you that MJR in a Word document, how long would it take you to tweak it to be able yeah. to work in your business? Yeah, like a minute. Yeah. If I give you the one on, on fundraising, how long does it take to tweak it? minute. We have, for instance, 32 things that our, reception do, our receptionist does. Mm. Two of them are really, really tied to our software and probably unique to us. Right. Um, 30 of them, any business could use and tweak it and they're ready to go with their receptionist. Same thing happens in accounts receivable, purchasing, accounting. Let, here's another one. <clears throat> In account, I think this MJR. interview we should just go through all 400 MJRs. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> real quick, people who run a business have, will actually, have, I would love that. <laughs> so, yeah, but, we have we have yeah. one in, in accounting, we have yeah. one that says, you know, whether you whether you depreciate something or amortize it over time or expense it immediately, you know, you, you have a you, you know, we our guideline is is I think it's five hundred dollars or something like that. So we have a guideline that says, um, if if the item is has a useful life of a year or more, and it costs more than five hundred dollars, amortize it. Amortize it. If it's less than five hundred dollars, depreciate it. Now, can take that same MJR and now make it an MJR for your business. You may change them from five hundred to a thousand or whatever the case may be, um, but you can certainly take that MJR and tweak it and work in your business. And there are just hundreds those that you can do that with so now all of a sudden it's so easy for you to get your team up to speed in a ton in a bunch of these job requirements these systems if you will remember the mjr is simply a system right system is the documented the documentation on how to do something in your business and so now you you do that and and here's here's how i suggest that people do it too the owner of the business he doesn't want to go through all of these and do them himself right I mean, they don't want to do that. No. So what you do is you take the you take two of them for the reception area. You go to the receptionist, or and you take them and you tweak the two that I have to what you think your business is. You go to the receptionist and you say, "Hey," <clears throat> and this is after they've watched the DVD on how all this works and all that kind of stuff. You go to the receptionist and you say, um, "Hey, I want to take. I want to look at it like like it said in the DVD here. We're going to." document everything this is what i got out of that system that i invested in and these are two of them that i've done are these right and or or, or do we do it different from this and she says yeah they're right or no they're different she says oh, and he says well change them to what is right then okay right. <clears throat> and 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 let's make them work for you and then you give the, her the other 30 to 30 of them because two you've done two that you think are that you you can get right yourself okay you give them the her the other 30 including the two that yeah. uh were were uh that were based on our software because you can maybe even tweak those the whole idea is probably still there yeah. it won't that what you actually hit on the computer isn't the yeah. same but you, the whole idea is still there and then you give them give them to her and she say hey would you change these would you go in and tweak these to what we need we do in our business if right. we're doing that what have you done now you've empowered her right you said you're the expert i want you to create these systems for our business that's all part of it that's all part of getting the team empowered and looking yeah. how to fix things and get things better yeah and if you the benefits if you really mess it up, they'd be like, just give it to me, I'll do it. You don't even know what you're doing with this stuff. <laughs> nah, it's so easy. I mean, it's just so easy yeah. that it, it just, um, you know, the, the reality is you maybe have to check. It's, it's sad. Grammar is so sad. <laughs> it's, it's, it's taught, I think, almost as bad as, as math <laughs> anymore. But you may have to check some, change some grammar, but other than that. So Keith, tell me this. So out of, look back, if you think back to all the, 
systems that you documented, which one sticks out as saving you the most time? Like what, I'm wondering, you're a systems guy. What do you do on a daily basis? You know, we're all looking to get time back, right? What do you do that saves you the most it's time? Not, it's not a system that saves you the most time. It's not, now, I do, do things in my business, but it's not an MJR. But it's the, it's the combination of all of them saving time for everybody right. um, over time. And, there's, and so <clears throat> some of them are, well... Here, here's one that we did is we bought a computer system. This is many, many years ago. <clears throat> we bought a computer system that I thought our our sales reps online were, were basically uh, tele telesales people, and that I thought that they could go in and that they could enter the order online while the client was there. And and after a number of months, I'm going to my sales manager and I'm saying, "What's going on here? Why isn't this working? Why why aren't we able to enter these orders on?" online that's why we bought this system and she's she's saying you don't understand you know you you put in everything and all of a sudden the customer wants to change the shipping method and you got to go back and start all over or whatever the case there were all of these different things so what we did is we went in and we re-engineered that from the from the very beginning taking the sales reps into consideration the sales reps and and what the issues were with with the system that was there and fixed it all so that it really could be all entered online on uh, as you go now that's not a big deal today but 15 years ago that was a big deal I mean almost any software you get today it can do that but we went back and we then put together what we call make you happy action teams yeah. most of the time these these this systems don't need to have a team together to get it right but one of the things that we do is that we it's very critical that if we have a ma uh, uh, one of these make you happy job requirements that affects more than one department, if we want to change that, we need to get that other department in on the change also. Hmm. We can't just unilaterally so aware of it. have it changed. So that they're aware of it, they have the input, and they can and they can uh, they can make sure that things are done right without do screwing them up to start with. Yeah. So Keith, I want to go back to you guys were named the best <clears throat> employer to work for in Washington. And mm -hmm. what did you do? So what did you, what are some of the things you did? You don't, you don't have a foosball table. You don't have daycare. Uh, um, I'm well, just kidding. What did you do? It, it is all about this whole idea of empowering your team mm -hmm. so that you not only have the systems in place, but you have the team empowered. Remember we have at the bottom of it says, do this exactly like this says, unless it doesn't work, then do it. Do what you need to do. Right. That's powerful. That's right. powerful. People love to be to have that kind of power mm -hmm. and know that they're trusted that much. The other thing that was critical is that f since the early 1980s, when I started the business, <clears throat> um, I've been a huge customer service maniac. Oh. Um, I study Disney, Stu Leonard, FedEx, Cabela's, all of the guys. I study them. I've written two books on customer service. Out Nordstrom, um, Nordstroms. Right, and yeah. the happy customer. And the happy, co okay. Right, and, um, and you know what? People love to work at businesses where they have pride in the business and have pride in their customer service. We have a, a guarantee here at our, at our company that says, if we ever let you down, call 1-800-426-5708. Call if you were not happy, um, um, call me. Uh, Keith on my direct line two five three eight five nine seven three one zero. I get about five calls a year, and we tell f eight thousand clients that, and we tell them that in every order, and we ship about over forty thousand orders a year. Right. But back to the guarantee. The guarantee actually says, <clears throat> um, what it, it says in um, our make you happy guarantee in forty in <clears throat> forty seven years. If we ever let you down, call us. If we don't make, if we don't make it right, and basically it's a, I, I lost track of it, but basically says in 47 years we've never refused a customer's request to make it right. Right, right. And that's the truth. In 47 years we've never said no to a customer in fixing a mistake that we've made. Now, <clears throat> we have had two customers that have taken advantage of that more than once, and so we then go back to them. And we say, you know, we, we're not going to be able to work. We can't with you serve anymore. you anymore. But in, yeah. <clears throat> but that's in forty-seven years. Not 30, 
70, 80, 90, yeah, 40, <laughs> You're 46 like, it years. seems too long. 40, <laughs> it seems too long, yeah. In 46 years, uh, you know, we've only had two customers that we've ever had to do that. We make clients happy. Most anybody who's been in a performance review in the past, whether on the giving end or the receiving end, knows that they suck. And actually, that's the title of my new book that will be out here in the what next month. Or so, uh, Performance Reviews Suck. Okay. Uh, <coughs> that's the title. <coughs> um, and if you just look at the difference in the names that we have, a performance review versus a personal development interview. If you're on the receiving end of that, do you want your performance reviewed in hindsight or would you rather be developed? Mm -hmm. If you're the manager, would you want to review someone in hindsight or develop them? Mm -hmm. And if you want results, should you be reviewing people or developing them? Mm -hmm. And it's a whole different concept in how to manage people. Hmm. I got this, I learned this from a guy named Vince Cipolli. Vince is 87 years old. Mm -hmm. He wants this whole concept of, that he uh, that he invented, if you will, to last beyond him. And so I bought the rights to his uh, what he's done and all of his archives, et cetera, et cetera. And that's also part of the management system that I'm now teaching. And so we're we're showing people how to eliminate performance reviews and replace them with personal development interviews. Mm. You know, a performance review is like looking in the rear view mirror to try and drive your car. Yeah. Uh, and, and one of the ways that I like to describe it, too, is that, you know, if you have a teenager, are you going to get the performance you want out of them by reviewing them once a year or maybe reviewing them maybe, oh, maybe every, every, every twice a year will work or maybe quarterly? You know, no, you know right. it can't. It doesn't work. So we talk about and we show people how to develop people rather than review yeah. people and eliminate performance reviews and replace them with personal development interviews. Yeah. And that has gotten... And so what, what we had going on here is we had great customer service in the 80s. In the 90s, we did... Um, a great job of getting all of our systems together mm -hmm. and powering our team to know that they are the people that are creating these systems and that if they're not working to that we really do truly want them to change them to what does work um, so again we had customer service we had the systems, so we were doing things right but what really uh, propelled us is in in the 2000 in the, in the decade of 2000 we we eliminated performance reviews, and actually we had stopped doing performance reviews because they were counterproductive, and we just were kind of managing performance by the seat of your pants, if you will. Right. Uh, and, but in the decade of 2000, we started um, with the performance development, the personal development interviews, and so that got the business to then ex explode so that we got the best out of everyone. It didn't mean we, you know, when we when we were doing the in the personal development interviews, we are developing people by meeting with them in these little ten to twenty me minute meetings, um, either once a week or mm -hmm. once every other week, mm -hmm. depending how how much change we want in that position yeah. or how much help they need in that position. For instance, um, our accounts receivable and accounts payable people, they have a 10-minute meeting once a month. There's just not, it's everything is so systemized there yeah. that there's not a lot to learn from. Um, salespeople have them um, every other week and they're usually about 20 minutes um, a, a, each, each time. Um, is that a group I, setting or is it one-on-one? -on -one? Nope. One on one with your manager, okay, and <clears throat> and these and and you go over these these eight to ten areas and you discuss them and and you're working on on developing people rather than reviewing them. Yeah. and and the whole idea. Here's what's wrong with management systems that we use. The management systems that we use were are really developed in colleges and universities to be used by Fortune 500 companies, yeah. um, and you know, if you've ever been in that kind of business, you know that they make things work on the backbone of mid-level managers that are willing to work 80 hours a week to get the next promotion and go right. on from there. Right. Now, in your small business, you're that person. You're everything. You're, you're that one that's right. doing that. Yeah. And 
and you're the one that's doing that 80 hours a week. And they were just never designed to work in there. And, and what happens is that in these systems, systems, management by objectives, it's focused on catching people doing things wrong. And we flip that and we focus on catching people doing things right. Mm. Have you ever been part of a performance review? Yeah. Jeremy, have you? Sure. Um, here's the difference. You, you know what that's like then. Now, there are people that do them well. I, 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 every every mm. once in a while, when I'm, when I'm talking in front of a group, I ask, how many people have been part of a performance mm. review? And 80% of the room I mean, even if it's a, if even if you're self-employed, like I was uh, contracted for another mm -hmm. company doing work for them, you still it's not called the performance review, but they're still reviewing your performance, you know, right. and right, you right. have to defend what you've done and right. for future work, essentially. Yeah, and on a contractor yeah. basis, it's a bit different than the yeah. employee, um, but the the difference is is that in the performance development interview, we I call it the Guy, the person being developed, it's their opportunity to brag. Mm -hmm, it's their mm -hmm. opportunity to tell you all of the cool things that they've done since you last met. Right. And, <clears throat> and it's your job to make sure as a manager that they go out of there pumped up, ready to go take on the world yeah. and do even better. And, and here's one thing that I didn't really believe when I first learned it from Vince, and that is that it, in every per personal development interview, the person being interviewed should leave pumped up, ready to go, and take on the world unless you're ready to fire them. Yeah. Now, i got to tell you, I did not believe that at first. I was like, no, nah, you need constructive criticism. You need that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just went with it. I trusted Vince, and I went with it, and it's true. I mean, uh, you go in, and, and you, you help pump these people up. You tell you you pat them on the back for the things they've done well you make plans on doing other things and doing other thing and doing some things even better and in the training that comes with the system that is 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 from Vince actually it's four and a half hours of training you learn how to massage people and how to make sure that you get them leaving that interview pumped up ready to go take on the yeah. world how did you go from what you thought you like no you need constructive criticism to actually weaving that in there or do you not at all if there's certain things but you want them we, to improve we don't I, it's it it comes out different than constructive criticism mm -hmm. it's it it, it you it, it's basically working on the problem together and rather than being constructive criticism mm -hmm. it's finding mm -hmm. the solution together gotcha um and um so it's the same result yeah and and basically what we want to see is that we we move the person forward on an ongoing basis, that they're always moving forward, and that, uh, and as long as they're moving forward, we're good. Yeah. Okay? When they're not moving forward, and so, for instance, I mean, you, you do have times <clears throat> when, you have to, when you have to move back to, um, to telling them exactly what to do. Let, uh, here's an example. We all have personal lives, and we have a, we've had a salesperson here that her personal life just when it was not good, her job performance was not good. Right. Her personal life was good. Her job performance was fabulous, one of the best we had. Yeah. So there's this whole idea of of when someone is new, we work on them in a – we want to move people from a position where we're telling them to then what to do to then we're selling them on what to do. Mm -hmm. Then we're participating with them on what to do. And then as they grow and, and mature, we've gotten them to empowerment. And so when, when the personal life for this person was in good shape, she was in empowerment. It was like, we didn't have to, we didn't have to make sure she did anything. It was like, mm -hmm. wow, it's great. I mean, she's one of our stars. When the personal life went to hell, then all of a sudden, we're back to going back to telling them what to do. Mm. We're like, no, you need to get here. It fluctuates. Be here. Uh, you know, that, and, and so you need to be here uh, at this time. You need to put in, do this number of calls and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you, we do make sure, and we have smart goals. You know, we have uh, um, goals that are specific, measurable, attainable, r uh, relevant, and timely. 
um, and we're working on those. And then we also we have to have the numbers then to go back on. And if they're if they're making progress towards those goals, um, then you know we're giving those them the pats on the back. If they're not, we're they're seeing that they're not making the progress every bit as good as you are. And you're talking about okay, what do we need? What do, what do, what do we need to do to make sure that you get get the right number of phone calls made? What do we need to do to make sure that you send out the num- right number of letters that you need to, et cetera, et cetera? That of course is talking about a sales person in that position. Mm-hmm. So under my theory on your your formula to success, we talked mm-hmm. about the employee happiness and the you know how you can help highly you know uh, business teams become highly productive teams. Um, and then I want to address the customer service component for a second and what you learn from Nordstrom and Disney because you spent a lot of time studying these companies and then what you brought into your own from studying Nordstrom and Disney. Yeah, well, for me, the biggest thing is that most most businesses simply do not train for customer service. Mm -hmm. And if they do train for customer service, they have some training, and things get better for a while, um, and then two or three weeks later, everything is right back to what it was before. Right. The biggest thing that you need to do is be consistent and persistent in your reinforcement of that training. Mm -hmm. Um, We have a, a... on our website to get our book, it asks, what does your customer service training look like? And it basically goes from, um, we tell people they should give good customer service training and expect them to do that. And then it says, oh, we, we, have, some, we have some meetings once in a while, da 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 And it goes from, from doing basically nothing to going up and saying, we have formal training that everyone goes through, and we consistently and persistently remind people of that of what they should be doing. So that's the that's the fifth um, box that they can check. Mm-hmm. Only two percent of the people that go to the go to the website to buy the book, and these are people that are interested in customer service, right. do have have training and mm-hmm. reinforcement of the training. So mm-hmm. that's why customer service sucks. Right. Well, it sucks everywhere because <laughs> people aren't. They they may do a little bit of training. The majority don't do hardly any training, and um, it, it's mainly just we tell we give them some examples. The the two biggest ones are we expect them to give great customer service, and we tell them to. And then the next biggest, um, actually the biggest number of people that reply, the biggest percentage is we give them some examples of great customer service once in a while. Mm-hmm. And that's the amount of customer service training that people get. Yeah. And, and so it's no wonder. But here's what's critically important is that <clears throat> everybody says that, that people buy, for us be, buy from us because of our great customer service. And then mm. you ask them and you say, so what do you mean by that great customer service? What, mm. what do you do? Well, we give great customer service. Right. Well, what specifically do you do to give great customer service? Exactly. Well, just, we 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 tell our people that we, we, we give great customer service, and that's all there is. There's not specific things. And that's why, as for instance, in, in, in both books, what one is, has 57, uh, the first book, the uh, Norris and Norris, and that, that book is written specifically for retail stores. Yeah. Um, and, um, um, and then the, the, the Happy Customer Handbook is written to all, all basically all kinds of businesses. Yeah. Uh, the first book was basically my customers asking me to write it. <laughs> so, so, and then my customers were retail stores, so it was written to them. I got gotcha. you. The, the updated version is written for everyone. Um, and but but in there are fifty nine specific things to do. Yeah. You have exceptional customer service, right. and it's not um, just coming back with well we. We give great customer service. You know, again, most people when you when you ask them about what they actually do, they can't come up with anything hardly right, right. that they specifically do. So, where can people check that out, and what's an example they, from one of yeah, the get secrets? get um, go to uh, the Happy Customer Handbook dot com. Okay, the Happy Customer Handbook dot com, and they can actually get that for free. We charge them two dollars and ninety seven cents for shipping and handling. Yeah, that's great. Um, <clears throat> and um, and so you asked about what's one of the things. Yeah, what's people, one of the examples? Yeah. Okay, so one of them that, and I got this from Disney, mm. and Disney looks as their competition as anyone that your customer compares you to. Mm. So, for instance, 
Disney's competition, when somebody calls them on, a phone, on the phone and wants to make a reservation, okay. their competition is somebody like FedEx or L.L. Bean or somebody who has fabulous um, customer service over the telephone. Yeah. They look at that as their competition. They don't look at uh, even another hotel necessarily, and they certainly don't look at another amusement park as their competition. They look at the very best of people who handle incoming phone calls. So, so that's one of the critical things, is that to not just look within your industry mm-hmm. to see how you can give great customer service, yeah. but look outside of your industry also. And uh, an example we did here at work, and this is, this is, I don't know, I, gosh, this is probably 15 years ago or maybe more, and I called up uh, Cabela's and ordered some fly fishing stuff. And back then, it's probably more like 20 years ago, back then in our industry, it was typical that you would take an order and ship it about three or four days later. Yeah. Uh, just happened all the time. And yeah. I called Cabela's and I, and I, uh, and I ordered some fly fishing stuff, and they said, well, that, that'll go out this afternoon. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> I'd never heard of that before. Again, yeah. this is 20 years ago. Today it's common. Um, but I took that from as, okay, that's our competition, not other, other, other um, fixture and, and, and supply stores for retailers. Our competition is anyone that our, uh, that our, comp- that our customer can compare us to. And so we figured out how we were going to do one-day shipping, and we got it done within a month or two. Yeah. Uh, and before that, we were three to four days. Yeah. Uh, but when you look at your competition as the best in the industry at every single little thing you do, at the best in the co- in the world, then you're looking at, at at really wowing your people. When you look at your competition as just your competition, we would still be shipping. Well, not now because it's caught up to us. But right. we would have been some lag. You were ahead of the game. Ahead of the we curve. were ahead of the game because yeah. we looked at the competition as somebody as anyone your mm. customer can compare you to. So that's that's one of the ideas. Yeah, I love that. You know, so look outside your industry. You're going to see. Start comparing yourself with the best of the industry, and also probably innovate your your business in general from what other people are doing. Yeah, I love that. If you don't mind, I want to share another one. Go ahead. Yeah, well. share as many as you like. <laughs> and this is your customers. Your customers need to know your your customer service expectations. Okay. First, before that, your customer service expectations need to be extremely high. But then, what's critical to to uh, to understand is that your customers to need to know that that's what they should expect. And there's a couple reasons for that. Mm-hmm. Is that number one, if you tell them that, they'll tell you when you mess up. Right. Whereas most customers will just walk away. If they don't expect you to give great customer service, yeah. they just think it's just like anybody else and they walk away and they, they don't tell you. We love them to tell us, and that's why we tell them. Call us if we ever let you down, and and and, and then if it's still not taken care of, it's a, we say, call Keith on his direct line, the same line I gave you to call me <laughs> on here. Um, but what's, other, what's also c- cool about this is that if you if your team members know that your customers know your customer service expectations, yeah. they're going to really be afraid to not meet Keep those you expectations. In check. Yeah, you know they're going to they've got to meet those expectations now, and so it does it checks and balances on them too. Yeah. So how do you let your customers know what's expected of you? Uh, we do that a lot in in uh, well, first off, <laughs> again the the the. The Out Nordstrom Nordstrom book was originally written because I shared our customer service hmm. I with our customers via our, and, and basically for, oh gosh, for, what was it? Uh, my first customer service newsletter that went out was 1992, and it, and it had, uh, th- I had three reasons to send it out. Number one reason was to help our, our customers be, be better retailers. Mm-hmm. With the idea that if they if they can be better retailers, they're going to stay in business. They're going to keep buying from us, and they're going to grow and keep buying more of the stuff we sell them. Right. Um, the so, second yeah. reason, the second reason for sending it out was to let them know that to be top of mind whenever they're thinking of anything that we might sell. And the third was to actually maybe sell some stuff in the newsletter, but in that newsletter and telling them how to be better retailers because I was so um, oh gosh I was so what's the word. 
I was I was so I thought customer service was so important that a lot of telling them about being better retailers was customer service stuff, right. customer service stories, and what I shared with them, and all. And so after a while, people actually asked me, "So Keith, do you have all of these things written down anywhere where I can get them from them mm-hmm. from you?" And I was like. No, but after, I, but I thought, okay, well, I will. I'll put these together so I can offer it to my clients. And, and by the time I got done putting it all together, it was a book. <laughs> and that's where right. that's where Out Nordstrom Nordstrom came from. Uh, my clients actually asking me, "Do you have some place where we can get all of these ideas from you?" Yeah. So Keith, for give people an example of so they kind of understand who your customer is and what do they usually buy from you. From well, American, American retail. retail supply. Yeah, American retail yeah. supply is is we sell to independent and regional retail businesses. So yeah. regional retail chains and independent retailers. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> and we sell them a lot of bags, gift wrap boxes, bows, mm-hmm. ribbons, all of the packaging that they would use in their businesses, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's plastic bags, paper bags, the new um, reusable bags. We probably sell, at least in Washington State, we sell more reusable bags to different mm-hmm. co- to different clients than anybody in the state. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we don't sell more bags because we don't have Safeway or somebody like that buying from us, but uh, a lot of that stuff, any fixtures that they would use in their business, anything that they would put um, that they would put their product on, display yeah. cases, yeah. Uh, the, the wall systems that they use to hang things on, et cetera, et cetera. And we also sell point-of-sale computer systems, so the barcode yeah. systems, the computers, et cetera. Yeah. And that's the business that I just sold a couple yeah, of Yeah, what's, what's been one of the most popular items? That you sell? Oh well, 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 we we love to sell bags yeah. because bags are used up. They go out the door, and they have to order some more. Right. I mean, and and that's and and so that's either either shopping bags that are made out of paper or plastic bags. Typically, our customer is not using the most inexpensive bag on the market. They're using one that's uh, a little bit higher quality. Typically, has their name printed on it, um, um, and that type of thing. Yeah. We do for Warner Brothers. That is just. It's a piece of art. <laughs> really, a, it really is. It's a piece of art. Yeah, because I remember when I talked to Travis. I don't know how old he was, but I think someone ordered like some kind of toy or something, and he had to go to all the stores across like Washington or something to try and. Oh, yeah. Do well, you know what well, I'm talking what, about? yeah, yeah. What that was is it was actually uh, when Travis first started here. We we did a a big. Um, um, customer appreciation event. We ended up with 800 people at the uh, t- c- Tacoma, 800 customers at the Tacoma Convention Center for us for this customer appreciation event that we put on. And um, we wanted to use a puzzle piece to uh, mm, right the puzzle mail. piece. Yes. So we wanted to use a puzzle piece in the direct mail. Um, and if their puzzle, if their piece that they got uh, fit the puzzle. And this was sent out to like twenty five thousand people, right. and so and eight hundred showed up. So the chances of them showing up with the right puzzle piece was not good. Was, um, well, you know, it, it, we we took our chances <laughs> and whatever. And it was something that, and I don't even remember what we gave away. I think it was it was a Mediterranean cruise or whatever. Yeah, you said there were cruises, there were TVs, <laughs> yeah, like other and, things. And, yeah, and 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 so uh, we basically sent out these puzzle pieces, and one of them was the piece that if it if it fit in the puzzle when they came to our event they won this grand prize thing right right yeah. but that was a, that was Travis was using that as an example because of the 3D mail thing where right. he, he said we probably said well one of the reasons uh, we got into this business is that my dad had used this to um, grow his other businesses and yes we, i had which we use 3D mail all the time <laughs> yeah well, I just want to know what grunt work is, uh, his dad made him do. Yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so he went around, to, so back then he went around all, all the dollar stars in the area until he got 25,000 pieces of puzzles. Right, exactly. Um, so the employee happiness, highly productive teams, the customer service, and now I'll talk a little bit about the marketing end of things. You love the marketing end of things. Yep, so, I love it. Well, yeah, what have been some successful campaigns that you look back on and go wow that that worked exactly how i wanted it to well the the biggest one would be the basically not a not a campaign but the whole marketing 
plan that I came yeah. in with when I became general manager of the business. Okay. Back in 1981, when I became general manager, we sold handheld price marking equipment to retail stores. Mm. Kachunk label, kachunk label, kachunk label. Got it. Um, I came in, the business had, had been in business for 11 years, it had negative net worth. Um, that business was going to die. Yeah. Um, and so I came in with the business, with the marketing plan of, of selling retailers everything they need to run their store. Now, mm -hmm. that didn't happen overnight when you have negative net worth and no cash <laughs> right. uh, and you need to add product. Um, but, uh, but the marketing plan was there, and over the years we leveraged to beat the band. And, and uh, today I don't know of anyone in the country who sells more different products to retailers than we do. So we sell retailers virtually everything they need to run their store. So what kind of things were in your marketing plan? Well, <clears throat> so we had handheld price marking guns. <clears throat> and so the first thing I looked at is what else, and one of the things that was good about that is that they click the labels out, the labels go out the store, they need to buy more labels. That part I liked. That yeah. part was really good. So when we looked to add new product, we wanted to do the same kind of thing. Mm. We wanted to um, get products that they bought it. It's it consumable, out. it's disposable. Yeah. Right, it was something it. they needed yeah. in their business. That's so smart, the yeah. Store. Um, and so the obvious product was bags um, yeah. for their store. And here's, here's what's um, important, too, is for me, in this case, it wasn't just marketing that allowed that to happen. I had actually been a, an accounting major in college for two years until I had to make, take a marketing class <laughs> to get my, you know, to get your, your, your business degree. Right. And I took the marketing class and they said, I love this. I'm switching from accounting to marketing. But right. those two years in accounting were critical to me because I came in to this business with a negative net worth. They had no ability to go out and borrow any money whatsoever. I certainly didn't have any money. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> the, the the address on my birth certificate uh, is uh, Think Trailer Court Number Nine. <laughs> I mean, we, and um, and my parents did a great job of mm -hmm. moving up from there. But I mean, yeah. we did, we certainly didn't have money. I, yeah. I worked my way through college, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so how do we make? How do we go get some money? Well, yeah. the owner of the business at the time was doing his accounting on a cash basis. I came in and moved that to an accrual basis of accounting, and all of a sudden we had negative, we had positive net worth, and we're able to go to the bank and borrow. A, I'm talking a few thousand dollars to put some inventory of bags in the back room. And my theory on the marketing plan was that our clients loved us. They loved us with our selling them price marketing equipment, but we just didn't have anything else to sell them. Mm. And so that now these people who loved us, we had bags for them to use. Mm -hmm. And we were buying them at wholesale. And, and, uh, and what was critical then, too, is that it happened to be at a time when plastic bags started showing up for retailers. Um, you know, back in the day, there were only paper bags. There weren't plastic bags for retailers. Mm -hmm. to use. Um, but these plastic bags made it... And, and in the day when you wanted to do paper bags way back then, they weren't interested in talking to you, the warehousers of the world, etc. They only wanted to deal with big guys. Well, all of a sudden, these plastic bags come out, and anybody, mm -hmm. uh, anybody can buy an extruder, an extruder and start making plastic bags. And so that, that was key to us, too. Yeah. Being able to then go out and sell those plastic bags, we made some money on them. We added tissue paper. We made some money on that. We added gift wrap. Uh, we added bows. We added ribbons. We did this, and then we ended up buying out a. We ended up actually buying out a competitor, <coughs> um, mm. long ways away. It was in Phoenix, Arizona, and we're up in Seattle. We ended up buying that business for pennies on the dollar. Um, but what we got there, more important than the, um, well, not more important than the customers, but the, because the customers were the thing ones that gave us this, is is enough volume to start buying our packaging mm. and at great at way better prices. Reduce your cost. Qualify to buy from vendors that we didn't qualify to buy from previously. Mm. Um, and so that was huge for us. Yeah. You know, it's so funny because when you say bags, I'm thinking, that's genius. You know, I wouldn't even, how do you even think because something that's reusable, were you, th were you brainstorming one day, okay, what's reusable? What were you brainstorming that actually led you to bags? Well, we were 
and all along here, I'm I'm looking at this at what we're doing, yeah. and it's like and and how do we you know how do we we had three ways we could have gone back then. Yeah. We were selling marking guns. We could have gone and we could have went into just um, warehouses and sold their marking equipment to mark product and and do labels for warehousing and right. that type of thing. The other thing we could have gone into is we could have specialized in in going into food and providing meat trays and and things like that into the food industry. And the reality is I didn't like the food industry. That sounds horrible to me. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't like the food I didn't like that in industry and I had come from that. I worked in grocery for 8 years mm. all the way to college and high school. And uh, so I looked, I basically just looked at what do, what do our clients use? We, we have these clients, mm-hmm. what else do they use? What do they use? So yeah. we, added, we added the packaging and those type of things, and then so we got really good at that, and then we added the fixturing, and again, same thing happened. We ended mm-hmm. up buying out a fixture company um, yeah. that was frankly not run very well, but we got a lot of fixture volume, and we got... Um, our our main resource out of China, which not all of our fixtures come out of China. In fact, not even a majority do. A huge majority are actually made in the U.S. But mm. we found a we got a great manufacturer in China that we've been buying from now for 25 years. Yeah. Um, and so we did that in fixturing, and then it came to okay, what else can our clients use? And now we're yeah. into point of sale computer systems, etc. So it's just been a, a matter of yeah. looking at what our current clients use. Right adding products for them with the theory that they like us, they'll buy from us as long as yeah. we can be competitive in any new product. Yeah. I love that simple, you simplify things so well. Simply <laughs> is what do your clients currently use? And that's what you get into because they're already buying it. Yeah. Right. I love exactly. that. Um, also with marketing, I know you've been um, following and uh, in the Dan Kennedy circle yep. for a long time yep so how did you first discover him and that direct response yeah i got to know i got the i, I heard of the name dan kennedy through actually i uh, somebody introduced me to gary halbert mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i was getting gary halbert's newsletter and so i'd heard the name dan kennedy and then uh one of the zig ziglar things came around to mm-hmm. town I saw that Dan was in it. I wanted to go to the Zig thing anyhow, and I saw Dan was in it. So I thought, I'm going to go listen to this guy. And I can still remember because I was, my sales manager went with me, and, and Dan's getting ready, and the last big guy was on on stage, and Dan's getting ready, and, and my sales manager is like, hey, I'm, hey, let's let's leave. We don't need to listen to this guy. And it's like, this is the guy I came to listen to. <laughs> I said, no, we're not leaving. <clears throat> so I stayed. I bought Magnetic Marketing back in 1991, I believe. Yeah. And I've been a disciple ever since. Um, my first uh, mailing with Dan is now it's it's an updated version of it, but not mm-hmm. not much. But yeah. my first mailing that I did using Dan's three step uh, campaign is still in Magnetic Marketing today. Really? Yeah. What is and, it? Yeah. Uh, it's a three-step campaign that yeah. we use to um, basically get new clients to raise their hand and say they're interested in us, and we send them a bunch of free stuff. Okay. Uh, the first campaign I did had a 37% response rate. Wow. And What do you send them? <clears throat> I, it was the simplest damn letter you've ever seen in your life. Uh, it was a dollar bill letter. Okay. Really, yeah, so Gary Halbert's dollar bill letter. And uh, basically said, um, we're here, we can help you, and... Um, we want to give you a bunch of free stuff, which was kind of, it was samples, if you will, of, of a bunch of the stuff that we sold that they could actually use in their business. It was mm-hmm. like 10 bags and, and 20 pieces, uh, uh, t- 20 sheets of tissue paper and, and some peg hooks and da 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 and they, and they had to choose what they wanted, so mm-hmm. it meant they had to basically look at all at, at, at our stuff in order to choose and, right. and we basically just wanted them to call us up and request our catalog and uh, and they did mm-hmm. <laughs> and there was we ran that for years and years and years it now doesn't work without a telephone call added to it oh really a follow-up back in the call day, you mean? Back in the, yeah back in the day we used to now we need to do a follow-up telephone call with it to make it work back in the day when we were doing it um, and doing extremely well with it, um, it was just the f- 
it was a three-step campaign. The second letter basically said the same thing as the first letter um, and maybe sweetened the deal a little bit. And the third letter was the same thing again. Yeah. And, if they and, didn't and respond, we had, obviously. We had, the, we had yeah. the typical response that I tell. You know, I think you, you know that we do the um, Dan Kennedy um, local chapter up here, so we do marketing, consulting, and that type of thing. Mm-hmm. And um, the same thing that I tell everybody there, and, and, and I've never seen this not work, although I'm sure, I'm sure at some point it, it, it doesn't, but <clears throat> the, the results that we got on letter two and three equaled the result, the response that we got on letter one. Really? So let's say, for instance... Wow. If you send out letter one and you get a 10% response rate, yeah. you can plan on sending out, if you send out letter two and letter three with mm. basically the same offer, yeah. a little bit different wording, the, the total response rate that you're going to get out of two and three is going to equal what you got in one. So you'll get out of those next two, you'll mm. get another 10%. And I have never seen that fail to work. Wow. That's amazing. And I, I just tell, and, and I get so many people that just say, that I consult with, and, and they're, they're pleased as punch with their, first, with their first letter, and I tell them to do letter two and three, and they're, like, they, they're like looking at me like I'm, I'm sideways. You know, how, how, why would somebody respond when, to two and three when they didn't respond to one? It's like, I don't know, and I don't care. Just send it. <laughs> don't ask for an explanation. Just yeah. send it. Yeah. Um, so did you hire, did you write the letter yourself? Did you hire a copywriter yeah. or what? No, I just wrote it. Okay. And it was fancy. I mean, it, it, that first letter was not, I mean, it was just following Gary Halbert and Dan Kennedy, um, advice and, and, um, you know, we got their attention with the dollar bill. Right. And you staple an actual dollar bill for people who don't know what a dollar bill letter is. You, you yeah. staple an actual dollar bill to the top of it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yep, exactly. <clears throat> and then what we did is after a number, after a while, we thought, well, let's 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 practice, let's try a um, a million, a, fa- a million dollar bill. Mm-hmm. And the reason we want to do a million dollar bill is it cost us fifteen cents rather than a buck. <laughs> and and uh, we found out that that our our response rate dipped slightly, mm. but the re- ROI went up, went up. So we changed to the million dollar bill. Mm. Um, and then here's a cool one. We yeah. changed to a Peruvian, oh, what was it? Some kind of foreign currency, mm-hmm. um, um, which Travis has at the 3D Mail uh, site. Okay, and we changed to a foreign currency. It had to be about the same size as a dollar bill because we didn't want one of these little things that looks like a little monopoly <laughs> or a little, right. uh, a little sorry card or something like that. It needed to look like a like a, about the right size. We changed to a foreign currency, and our, and our response rate went right back up to what it was with a dollar, and yet we weren't paying a dollar for it. Wow. That's and awesome. That was, just, I, that was just, just testing, you know, doing what you need to do in direct mail and testing one versus another. We tested all along. We tested that forever. We would test this versus that. We would try a little bit different opening here, a little bit different here and there. And, and we tweaked it throughout the years. And, and um, But the letter that uh, we still use today is based on that very same letter we sent yeah. out years ago. That's, all, that's amazing. What else, Keith, do you use from what uh, you learned from Dan Kennedy? Well, the biggest thing is um, do everything. Um, don't don't rely on and, and, and absolutely never rely on one thing. Um, ne- don't rely on one vendor. Don't rely on one uh, product. Don't rely on one way to get customers. Is yeah. the marketing place? Is the marketing end of it? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we. I'll give you an example. In um, well, it was about three years ago. Google, uh, up until about three years ago, we just kicked butt when it came to Google and their Google AdWords and being number one, two, three in natural search, on yeah. all kinds of stuff. Uh, about three years ago, they changed their algorithm and, and our number of leads went down by 30% overnight. Wow. Um, and, um, but we were still doing the other things that we do. We were still right. doing trade shows. We were still doing uh, direct mail. We were st- still had our our um, sales reps making phone calls so that we weren't dependent on that one thing. And uh, I've just seen it work too many times. Like, for instance, back when when we were just price marking for a while there, we had a number of 
I'd call them competitors, but they're not so far away from us that they weren't really competitors. But we had people in California or, or wherever that were so dependent on one customer when they lost the customer, they were out of business. Um, so, you know, one is the loneliest number in business. Right. One on anything uh, just doesn't work. And one way to get clients just doesn't work. I'm doing a lot of Facebook ad type stuff right now. And the number of those guys that I that I, I work with and then are in a, in a mastermind group with, uh, they only have Facebook for getting customers. Mm -hmm. and Dangerous. Facebook, it's it's really dangerous. They better stay on top of it. <laughs> you know, they better stay, try and figure out what the heck they're doing because when they don't, they're going to be out of business. So how did 3D mail results come about? Well, that was actually, Travis and I were in uh, Dan Kent, actually, this was Bill Glazier's. Travis and I were in Bill Glazier's uh, mastermind group. Mm. And uh, I'd seen, there was another guy that did 3D mail type stuff that would come to the Kennedy events and have a booth. And he um, quit showing up. And so I asked Bill, is, is he going to be back? And Bill said, no, he won't, he won't be back for whatever reason. And uh, I'd always known that we could do that stuff better than this other guy did yeah and the reason i knew it is that i i knew that i could get all of that stuff out of china and bring it in on my containers right and you're already doing it for the american retail right i'm bringing yeah. that stuff, i'm bringing containers over already from american retail the guy that was doing them before was buying everything domestic i um, and the big one the big items the ones that have some volume there and and price I knew that I could um, get them out of China. And, and, and the other thing is, is that the part of the shipping and taking orders and all that stuff, it's just what we do. It's right. what we are. It's what we do. We bring in things in big volume. We, sh we break them up and, and send them out. So I knew we could do it well. So basically, after I talked to Bill, I went to our, our the mastermind meeting and told, and we presented the idea of doing 3D mail. And our, ourselves, Travis and I, and the guys were like, well, sign me up. I'm on board. Yeah. Um, um, get, let, let me know as soon as you got it. And, and so we decided to go into the business. And we, were, we sat on the airplane on the way back and talked about how we were going to do it. So what's <laughs> one of your favorite campaigns that's gone out, either that you've used through 3D Mail results or a client? Oh, gosh. There's, you, my, my favorite let me see if I can think of a specific where someone actually used with results. Because there's so many. Because uh, what about one of the Dan Kennedy? I mean, I know a lot of the people used it. Like Bill Glazer used it. Dan, I mean, they all used it. What about one of those people from the from your mastermind? Well, the, 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 the Kennedy guys today still use our little um, army man. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they, they put that. And again, what 3D Mail does is it gives something bulk. So right. they have to open it, and they they get this thing, and they almost and they have to read the first few sentences. So, so that's that's the advantage of three D mail. And mm -hmm. so, uh, Kennedy guys are today with their um, with their boot camp that they do. They send out for their fast start boot camp for new members. They send out a an army man in a mailing and basically say, "Come to our boot camp, and we're going to teach you everything you need to know about Dan Kennedy marketing." Mm -hmm. it, it obviously works because they've been doing it now for five years or whatever. So right. it works really good. Here's one that we just recently did yeah. with uh, with Trav, and, <clears throat> and this guy is in our mastermind group. He actually flies up from Grants Pass, or Oregon. Um, every other month for a mastermind group and he has a small um health food store yeah. uh, and he he's 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 just really um enveloped the kennedy mastermind ideas and he recently used travis's fake fedex envelope if you will to send out to new movers and um had an incredible response hmm. um i don't remember the the exact numbers in fact you'll probably see it in a kennedy in a gkic newsletter coming up here because i'm gonna i'll send it to dan and a lot of the things i send him end up in the newsletter um because this was just a, a great result for this guy yeah. and, and basically having them come in um get some free stuff and sign up for his loyalty program and the reality is that he knows he knows that people who sign up for his loyalty program are going to pay are going 
going to buy, on average, X number of dollars over the next few years. Right. So, uh, so it's key for him to get him in, sign him up for the loyalty program, and go from there. Um, and I'm going to actually I need to email him today and ask for the results again. But it was it was just it was it was make money right up front, and then now have customers on his loyalty program f- um, for as long as they stay. So what did he send was, in the FedEx envelope or the fake FedEx had, envelope? He had like an eight page. Um, um, actually, let me grab it. He had like an eight page um, on a bunch of highlighting different clients that he have, has and their story of how they use his products um, to overcome their arthritis, their whatever, this, that, and the other thing. Mm-hmm. It basically says, uh, please accept our our free welcome to the neighborhood gift for you enclosed is a $15 gift certificate to use towards any purchase in our stores. No strings attached. So there's $15 gift certificate. Wow. This cover letter from him. Um, and a key, the key is, again, most people, now you may get them as a business owner, these fake um, FedEx envelopes, but most people don't get them at home. So, right. so it has to be opened by these people. Right. Um, as uh, his his uh, his menu from it for his little um, um, restaurant that he has there in the business, mm-hmm. and then the rest is let's see here how many pages is it? yeah it's eight pages it's eight pages of success stories mm-hmm. from different clients right um, it's just it's just full of testimonials of the product that they used and how it it helped them with whatever here's one for instance. Bill Becker, a 63-year-old truck driver from Grants Pass, had had this to say about vision optimizer. So he had bought something to improve his vision. Mm-hmm. Uh, Catherine, a 67-year-old Grants Pass woman, can use her hands again. Um, another one, reversing osteoporosis. And, and they're all um, basically um, case studies on these different mm-hmm. people and what they've used. And it's eight pages, and you just... You just uh, kick butt with this thing and this is this is, i mean who else who, who does that in the health food store who right. sends out the new movers into the area right. um uh eight pages something that says come in fifth gets fifteen dollars free and eight pages of success stories of how people have um have have, uh, have got uh, experienced relief pain from sciatica um lowered blood pressure um, and large prostrate, yeah. up back and gone, and whatever, and uh, had a great result on it. So that is amazing. So Keith, so basically, you do is he used your company, 3D Mail Results. He had uh, the fake FedEx envelope. He had, and then he put the kind of the gift certificate and the page letter. He'd send it out, and he would um, your company help him get the list of that, or does he do that separately on his own? No, we got the list for him. Okay. Three email got the list for him. That's we great. we we got the list and we sent him the envelopes. In this case, we didn't do the actual stuff. Okay. Envelopes, yeah. Envelopes, whatever. But we yeah. can do that if, if he wants. Yeah, that's what I do with you. There's mm-hmm. no way I'm stuffing envelopes. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, I understand that. Yeah, <laughs> the fact that you do that, I'm like, yeah, that's all you. You could handle that. Um, and then they'd come in and he'd sign them up for a loyalty program? Right. And I don't know if you're familiar with Royal, uh, Rory Fat. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, he actually uses uh, Royal, Rory Fat's uh, royalty rewards. Okay. Um, and, um, and actually he signed up for Roy. And, uh, you know, he, he got to know, he was a customer of ours. This is how this goes around. It's kind of right. cool. He right. was a customer of ours at American Retail Supply. I did my customer appreciation event, which I, I did with Bill Glazier. I had all of the biggest speakers in the, that whole area yeah. for that event. I did that with Bill Glazier. So this guy comes and he signs up for um, Bill Glazier stuff at my event because he's a customer of American Retail Supply. He comes and signs up for Bill Glazier stuff at my event. Um, continues to be a, a Glazier guy. Finds out about um, Glazier Kennedy then and becomes a Glazier Kennedy guy. And all this time he's buying from us. He's getting this stuff. And and actually back at that event in 2005, he signed up for um, Roy Fats Royalty Rewards Program. 
um, so that's what's key about this too. Is he's got that program that that actually you know this this is the kind of guy I love because you know he's he saw this stuff and it's worked for him and and he he just kicks butt yeah. in a little store down there and where other most natural food stores that are his size are just going out of business because they're getting put out of business by whoever. Right. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so then. Oh, oh, and then we started the local mastermind group up here, and he started coming to our our mastermind and got these ideas from our mastermind group. Mm. I mean, he didn't have this he didn't have this eight page full of case mm. studies until he came to our group. Yeah, yeah. And that thing. So it's fun. Yeah, it's I want you to talk about that because there's a lot of moving parts there. It's not like oh, you send out a letter and you get response. I mean, they use people like you. They use you know some systems as far as when someone comes in what do they do yep. so yeah it all works together yep and he's got you know he he, he basically is is he, he gives that you he asked about also yes about huge marketing ideas or you know what what's really helped and right. and the and and a big part of that is give give first yeah uh, um, and what I mean by that is that um, all of our clients get our newsletter. It's a real newsletter. It goes out, and, and like I said, it's, it's designed to help uh, retailers be better new- retailers. That's the number one reason. Right. reason. They also get our marketing tip of the week, um, actually our retail tip of the week, which um, is, again, the primary reason for that is to give them ideas that they can use in their business. It's not to sell them something. It's to give them ideas they can use in their business. Now, at the bottom of it, yeah, we have a special, et cetera, et cetera. But the whole idea is to give something so that you can, so that when it comes time to ask for something, you have a right to ask for it. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know, with with all that, Keith, and 3D mail results, um, you know, we talked a lot about the success stories. What's one where something didn't work? Whether oh, it's God. a marketing campaign or something. <laughs> my biggest, when people ask me my biggest, the biggest thing to, to avoid is to avoid doing something big that costs you a lot of money, a lot mm-hmm. of effort, a lot of time until you've tested it out mm-hmm. um, small. Mm-hmm. Um, we did. We were going to take on this line. Uh, this is many years ago, but it's still my biggest mistake. Okay. We were going to take on this line and and in the produce departments. We we were in grocery stores quite a bit back then, and we were going to go into produce departments with all of this great nutritional information and recipes and all of this stuff that was fabulous idea. I thought I thought it was a, a no brainer. Cannot lose. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, and we spent a ton of time, a ton of effort, um, um, learning about it, being part of the development of it, um, and going out and trying to make it work, and it just bombed. Mm. Absolutely bombed. So the biggest thing, the biggest suggestion I would give anyone is to make sure that don't, no matter how good something looks, find a way to test, test it, it first. <clears throat> before you go into um, making a big time, and I actually did that a bit with my management system. I I, uh, this, I I I basically sold that system, if you will, back at my um, comp, my my customer appreciation events yeah. back in 2005 and 2006. Mm-hmm. Now I, I hadn't put as much effort into it, and it was mostly just telling people what they need to do without me giving them all of these MJRs, for instance, these mm. heavy job requirements. And then in the, in the performance, in the personal development interviews, we give them basically all of the templates that they need to set up these personal development interviews for each of their businesses or for each of their or each of their employees. It was more of a theoretical thing without mm-hmm. all of those, those um, fill in the blank things to do. And so I, I I presented that at the customer appreciation event, and and that was my test. Is that, gosh, this thing went really well. So one day mm. I may, one day I may develop this totally uh, into a totally done for you system for right. people. So um, again, that would have been that's probably an area where if I look back, I'd say that I put a lot of effort into that first system, 
and I, it could have failed, but uh, in relationship to what I ended up with, it wasn't that much effort. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I see that's what you my, mean. My, that's my biggest thing. Leah, yeah. you're figure saying, out a way to test test it before you test it you before end you up spending too much money and too much effort. Yeah, like in that situation, much. you kind of test it. You just kind of threw it out there and say, "This is what it is." Do you want it? And you built it out after you actually got interest in it before vice versa. Right. Yeah. Um, it wasn't as good of a system then, but I, yeah. but, hey, but <laughs> I, 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 um, one of my, one of the guys that's in our mastermind group still today, uh, he bought that in 2005 and he is swears by it. And it wasn't nearly as good as what it right. is. Now. So, it works. Yep. Um, you know, Keith, since this, this has been very valuable, so thank you so much, uh, for sharing these stories. Um, you know, I'm going to take some of these directly and, and obviously I use you, you guys already and do some of these things, but, um, since it's inspired insider, I always ask, um, two questions, the lowest moment and the proudest moment. What's been the lowest moment business wise? Lowest moment for me was, um, 2008 when the economy just went down the tube <clears throat> and, um, um, I didn't know if we were going to make it. Mm. Um, I, I, I remember my um, VP of operations has been with me for decades, and in the in the conference room, and her saying, her crying and saying, "Are we going to make it?" And me saying, "I don't know. Mm. I don't know if we're going to make it." Um, and um, uh, me telling her that you know if you've got another opportunity, I wouldn't. I'm not going to tell you you should stay here. Wow. Right? Cause I don't know if we're going to make it or not. Um, and the biggest thing we did then is to get out, is to make sure that we did make it, is we went back to we zero base budgeting, which is you know, if the only, you don't hear that term very often other than with Carly Fiorino. Carly, she was talking about going back to zero base budgeting in, with the federal government. And I thought, oh my God, that would be so cool. <laughs> we would save so much money. Um, so we went back to the zero-based budgeting. We went back and said, do we need this? Um, yes, no. Can we um, reduce the price? Uh, can we go back to all of our vendors and negotiate harder? Yeah. Uh, um, and one of the things I did, for instance, back then, too, is I, I knew that I, I know my ROI on my marketing. And back then, we were doing a lot of um, Google AdWords. Yeah. And my ROI was over two years. If I spent a thousand dollars on Google AdWords today, I didn't get that back until about twenty six months later. Really? Did I, did I break even? Holy But I was cow. willing to do it. <clears throat> yeah. But I was willing to do it. That's that's you know it's it's just an investment. Yeah. Um, but so one of my guidelines was to go that all of our um, marketing that we did needed to have a one year or less our positive ROI on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we dumped Google AdWords totally. Yeah. Uh, and um, so the arc here, for the most part, was zero-based budgeting and, and making sure that um, we all worked as hard and as good and yeah. as uh, efficiently as we could. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, keep from... What's that? That would be my low moment. See, from a business standpoint, you put those things in place. Mm -hmm. What do you do from an emotional standpoint? Because <laughs> you spent decades building this business. <laughs> You know what I mean? Cry, <laughs> cry, you know? and uh, and you know, and talk talk with friends, talk yeah. with family, talk with uh, um, um, and uh, pray. Yeah, it's tough. Wow. Yeah. 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 I'll yeah, stop depressing you, but uh, yeah. and we'll go to the proud moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the proudest moment is is uh, doing all of this. Um, Growing a, a business that I'm ex businesses that I'm extremely proud of, uh, making differences in other people's lives, and at the same time staying married for forty years, yeah. and um, never ever having my family take second place to work. Mm -hmm. um, my proudest moment by far. Yeah. And I want to ask you about that, but I also want to just point out for the low moment, that's, I think, super valuable that what you shared because we can do that budgeting or renegotiating it at, right now. You know, whether we're, Absolutely. you know, whether Zero we're budgeting is like, oh right. my gosh, we have, right. every business should go back and do that every five years at right. least. 
So I'm I'm so glad you shared that because it's a reminder. Like, well, we don't have to be in <laughs> dire straits to do that, and that will make fact, a huge difference. I look difference. at that and I think of how much money we waste <laughs> right. by not doing it more right. often. Right. Yeah. Um, so on the proudest moment standpoint, um, so what's some secrets to 40 plus years of marriage for people out there? Uh, finding a spouse who is very patient okay. <laughs> with you um, and uh, knowing that it's not a one-way street, uh -huh. um, uh, knowing, you know, understanding that uh, along the way, you know, what the goal is. You know what? You know the goal is you know uh, uh, an intact family that you know you don't have to worry about you know at Christmas time visiting four grandpas and four sets of grandma and grandpas instead of two um, and all of those things that go with it and and uh, just understanding <clears throat> there was. Um, uh, huge in my life was Harry Chapin's song "Cats in the Cradle." Mm -hmm. Cats in the cradle in the silver spoon, yeah. a little black spoon, and it's about dad uh, who doesn't have time for his son mm -hmm. while the son is growing up because he's busy working, and then dad grows up or the son grows up and he doesn't have time because he's doing all of these things with his family and work, and uh, my. Um, goal, well, my number one goal every year while my kids were growing up um, was no cats. And, uh, and I was not going to have cats in the cradle. Um, mm -hmm. Number one goal. So that meant that, it, that I, had to have I had to spend time with them. Yeah. Uh, and I'm a huge believer in, in part, and a huge part of my management system and what's important to me is, is to give business owners um, the time that they need to spend with their family. Uh, that, so that they don't have cats either. Um, and that's where actually, that's where the management system came from, is that back in 1991, I was not um, going to give up the time that I spent with my kids. Um, mm. But I was growing this business, and it was going growing well, And but I had all of these problems going on, and, and I was totally burnt out. Um, because I wasn't willing to give up the time with the kids, but yet yeah. I, I was dedicated to growing this business, and there was absolutely no time for myself in any kind of fashion of my own personal health and well-being, if you will. So yeah. that's that's what led to, to saying, I don't want this business to grow mm -hmm. anymore, and then has seen this light at the end of the tunnel with studying people like Deming and, and those kind of people. Yeah. So that's... Um, that's huge to me. My, to me, I, um, um, if I, well, for instance, Rolf Williams, um, a guy that started with my management system in 2005, um, <clears throat> he has a son who's severely autistic. Mm. Um, and, and I don't know the age, I think it's, I don't, whatever it is, in a year and a half, he, um, he, the son, is no longer eligible to go to school or anything like that, wow. and yeah. so uh, he'll need 24-hour care uh, at home. Yeah. And so Rolf's goal is to make sure that his business is running so smooth yeah. that he can do half of that care at home, and so his wife yeah. doesn't do it all. If you can imagine a, a big, big boy that's now in his tw 20 years old or whatever, right. and, and really has, stressful. Yeah. And, and 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 needing to take care of that person. Yeah. Now, if he if he's got a business like most people, he can't get away from it. Yeah. But that's uh, he looks back at this and 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 what he's done, and it's like, and you know, his his biggest thing is to be able to be away yeah. from that for about be able to work twenty hours a week, um, starting a year and a half from now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Talk, talk about yeah. motivation to put systems in place. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Um, you know, talking about family, family is so important, and you have the pleasure of working with your son mm -hmm. on some projects. What's some, you know, for people who have family businesses or think about starting a business with a family, what's some advantages and disadvantages from from your standpoint? Well, disadvantages some kind, although we've had very few of that, is, is mm -hmm. that, you know, sometimes... Travis and I have a bit of the same personality, and and a couple times that's kind of exploded and and could have been 
bad, but both of us are smart enough to not let it go that way. We have not had very many of the disadvantages. Yeah. Um, we've had a ton of advantages, um, and they are. I get to work with my son, right? Uh, and uh, his when when his when his wife brings the kids down, I get to see the kids. Mm-hmm. And, when, and uh, um, although we don't often at all. Um, when we're away from work, we very seldom talk about work. Mm-hmm. You know, very, very seldom. Um, uh, kind of leave that at work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that, I don't know that I have any huge insight there. Well, I guess, we, let me ask you this. fine with us. Yeah, let me ask you this, Keith, because I know you have systems for everything. Mm-hmm. What about settling disputes? You know, because it's, it's especially important when you're going with family, and let, there's going to be blow-ups, there's going to be you know, disagreements. Is there some system with Travis that you have to settle a disagreement or, or something like that? We basically go back to the same thing that we use here with, um, and part of the management system that we have is mm-hmm. how to handle, how to handle conflict and confrontation. Okay. Um, and we go back to those, um, same, um, that same structure. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have conflict and confrontation that we use at work, and and we use the same thing when we have it at work, mm-hmm. um, and and it's just a um, a system that we have that uh, is is uh, well documented, and and we go we open up the little our little uh, booklet on co- conflict and confrontation, and we go down through it, and we make those guidelines, and this is how we're going to get through it. Yeah. And we, Follow the, we again. We just follow the system. What's one of the things in the, that we should be using? What's that? What's one of the things in that system for people oh, to help with their conflict? Um, let me see. Well, f- one of the things is to make sure that you're open and honest. Um, that uh, each person has time to say what they want to say without the other person interrupting. Mm-hmm. Oh, there it is. This is this will be easier. <laughs> um, um, listen without arguments, either verbal or nonverbal. Feelings need to be supported by facts and specific behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we would need to, uh, we have not yet, but if we did, we would get somebody, we would get a trained facilitator mm-hmm. um, in the business. All of our managers are trained to facilitate personal conflict. Mm-hmm. We don't have it very often. Mm-hmm. Um, but And the reason we don't is we also have this thing over here that says, um, um, personal conflict guidelines to share with your entire team and what they can do um, um, to take care of it. And the bottom line is, you know, there's all these things that say that you need to take care of it yourself, And but if you can't, this is what we're going to do right. to help you solve it. Now, the reality is they almost never want to do the help you solve it part <laughs> um, because right. it means... And getting into meeting with somebody and sitting down and and, uh, and um, getting through it. Yeah. But the meeting guidelines, if you do, is be open and honest. Everyone will have their say. Uh, listen without argument and verbal, nonverbal. Feelings need to be supported by facts and specific um, uh, behavior. And the facilitator, if you bring if you bring them in, the facilitator makes sure that you follow those ground rules. They yeah. allow for ventilation of emotion. They ask open-ended questions. They uh, listen objectively and, and offer feedback and goes down uh, the whole list of things to do there. Yeah. Keith, this has been fantastic. I Thank you so much. Where should we point people towards to check out more from you? <clears throat> A couple things. Um, they can get... Um, um, how to control your business and your and your life proven secrets to creating highly productive teams they can get that book by going to um, www.howtocontrolyourbusiness.com how to control your business.com mm-hmm. and if they want to get the uh, happy and both of these are 297 for shipping and handling $2.97 yeah yeah $2.97 yeah. yeah, and the other one if they want to get a steal the happy, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> the other, and, and I don't do that all the time, but I, we, we tell it to some people. Yeah. The other one is, is uh, go to, to get the Happy Customer Handbook, go to uh, www.thehappycustomerhandbook.com. Is it The Happy Customer Handbook? Yep. The, the Happy Okay. Customer. The Happy Customer Handbook. And they'll, I'll have them link that up too. 
Um, and then any other places? Um, you can go to keithlee.com okay. um, and find out all kinds of good stuff about us. Um, the Happy Customer Handbook. I just want to double check. Yeah. I, think, I think it is the, the, the is in there. Yeah, it is. Yep. Yeah, okay. Good enough. Yeah, and go to keithlee.com and yeah. check this out. Um, 3D mail yeah, results so also. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> absolutely. What else do we got going on? We, <laughs> if they're in the Pacific Northwest, uh, um, go to, um, uh, what is it? Uh, just, just email us. If what is it? If they're, interested in, if they're interested in being involved with our local um, uh, marketing group out here. Okay. In the Pacific Northwest. That um, sounds good. Go to, I actually go do know a bunch of Seattle people. Yeah, good. Yeah. Go to, um, uh, what is that? I don't even know what that is. But just go to 3D Mail or any of those and call us up and ask us about the local marketing group. Yeah. What is that for Travis? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I should know, but I don't. Sorry. It's all right. They'll, they could go to keithlee.com and ask yep. you if they have a question. So, Keith. Oh, here you go. Yeah. No BS. No. Yeah, no BS Puget Sound dot com. No BS Puget Sound dot com. Got it. And then what should we we talked about a lot of different topics. What should we leave people with? No. Oh gosh. Um for me, um, I would leave people with balance. Mm-hmm. Um, you know for instance, Dan Kennedy, for instance, says balance is bullshit. Um I don't. <laughs> I don't agree with that. I, I think that um, go 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 Google uh, Zig Ziglar's Balance Wheel of Life. Uh-huh. Um, check that out and try to be balanced. Um, <laughs> um, I, I I love how you 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 preface this with Dan Kennedy says balance is bullshit. Well, I does. I mean, and yeah. and um, but I but I also I know Dan pretty well, and he's a lot more balanced than you would think. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, he's got, uh, you know, uh, he, he talks, um, but f- for me, uh, that's, um, that's okay. number one thing. I mean, make sure um, uh, there is, you can't have family and, and work. You can mm-hmm. have both. You if you have, you if you have systems, right. If you have systems, right. Place, you can have family and work. You can have a life outside of work. You can fly fish. You can ski. You can do all kinds of stuff, and you can grow your business. And if you have the systems in place and you have buy-in from your team, Mm -hmm. now I'm not telling you to not be part of your business by any means, but Mm -hmm. if you have balance, if you have systems in place and buy-in from your teams, your business will improve whether you're there or not Um, because that's how it's done. That's how everybody works every day, and it's just part of the system. Um, and so I guess I'll leave with that. So actually, you made me think of one last question. Um, okay. The biggest fish you ever caught? Truly, fishing, fish, fishing. <laughs> you mean yeah, fishing. fishing. Yeah, well, fishing. Here, here, well, here I'm a little weird there too. Big fish don't impress me. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like fishing uh, the smaller rivers where I can wade up them and, and that type of thing. So my biggest fish is uh, now, and see, we're fly fishing, so we're fly fishing in rivers. We're not fishing in the ocean. Right. The biggest fish ever caught would have been some salmon I caught in the ocean sometime. But my biggest fish ever caught was probably at Rocky, um, um, Rocky Knob, no, Rock, Rock, uh, Rock Creek, Rock Creek in eastern Washington, probably about, 28 inches, maybe okay. three pounds, on Love a little uh, on a little five weight fly rod. Nice. Yeah. Keith, thank you so much. This has thank been fantastic. You. It's great. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 